from the late 1960s, early 1970s on, uh, when public sector workers started making wage demands and, and uh, trying to keep up with inflation, and let us say if they were nurses, were trying to earn what plumbers were earning. Often this was a very feminized working class. Um, the uh, governments, provincial and federal, started using this type of back-to-work legislation. They would follow religiously the procedures laid out in the general law, and then uh, uh, governments would uh, force them back to work for a particular period of time. Sometimes when uh, there was uh, uh, a generalized strike movement uh, in the context of the wage and price controls, they would remove the right to strike from all workers for a particular period of time, uh, and, uh, but only for a particular period of time. So we called this permanent exceptionalism, and, and the phrase came out of a comment by de Juvenal, the uh, French philosopher who once said, c'est seulement le provisoire qui dure, it's only the provisional that lasts. <laughs> and, and that has turned out to be the case. Now, one has to say the Supreme Court endorsed this uh, after we brought our Constitution home. Uh, in, in 1987. Uh, since then, there have been a series of rulings in more recent years which has declared some of these kinds of acts unconstitutional. By that point, of course, the workers have been forced back to work. And we know that once you've mobilized and organized working people, and they've developed a degree of consciousness and willingness to go through what is a, a difficult thing a strike with all that involves in terms of loss of income and insecurity and all the reprobation that is visited upon you if you're a public sector worker for going on strike. Uh, you know, they're forced back to work. It's very hard to get the thing going again, even after the Supreme Court says this piece of legislation was illegal. The legislation itself was restrictive uh, in terms of workers bargaining rights and, and uh, freedom to exercise their collective capacities to express their power. This made it all the more restrictive in this informal, uh, temporary, but permanent way. What was going on generally in the capitalist world between 1880 and 1920 and what happened in 1919 across the world, with Winnipeg being one of the major instances of it, was a process of class formation. Uh, that is, people becoming aware of having a collective identity, which of course formed itself often around, you know, were you a metal worker? Uh, you know, were you uh, a, a textile worker, were you a fireman, uh, etc., were you a seamstress, and so on. But a sense of collective recognition that all of us belong yeah. to a social class and that we are exploited by and have different interests from the people who employ us and their broader social circles and families, etc. And Winnipeg and, and the enormous class struggles that took place after World War I was a product of 30, 40 years uh, of that development of class consciousness that had partly to do with people, you know, it's often employers who organize unions inadvertently. They take uh, farmers, peasants, they bring them into the cities, uh, they put them into large factories, large establishments, etc. Uh, they house them in terrible conditions around the places they work. And the people develop a sense of, oh my God, we're in the same situation, even though we came from these very diverse villages where we never would otherwise have met each other. So even without union organizers, to some extent, people develop a sense of collective identity. 
And that's partly what was going on. Ironically, by the 1920s, as urbanization increasingly pushed people not to be living in necessarily the same areas where they work, as roads and highways and public transit allowed people to disperse, you know, that became, began to undermine that collective sense of identity. Uh, and it's been, you know, it's been a battle to keep that going. It's not impossible to keep it going, but it has been a battle to keep it going. With the introduction of the radio, of television, of cinema, you know, it used to be the case you'd go hear a great orator, and that would be your entertainment for the night at the Union Hall. Increasingly, people's entertainment became individualized. And corporatized. And corporatized and commodified. Um, so, you know, it's been a battle to try to keep that kind of class identity going. The Winnipeg General Strike was a product of that class formation, where seamstresses at the T. Eaton Company would, uh, did, leave their work, or the call girls working for the telephone company, as seeing themselves as having a common interest with metal workers, right? Uh, uh, with construction workers. Uh, you know, sometimes they were their daughters, etc., but that wasn't the essence of it. Uh, there was a class awareness which uh, has been hard to sustain.